Bonsoir. Good evening. Um, I'm Gaëtan Bruel, director of Villa Albertine, and I'm particularly pleased to welcome you uh, again tonight for the second installment of Villa Albertine Museum series, a new initiative we imagine together with the Center for Curatorial Leadership. The ambition behind this museum series is uh, rather simple. We wish to discuss the future of museums from a transatlantic point of view and through the eyes of 24 women leading museums on both sides of the Atlantic. After launching the series two weeks ago by discussing how the greatest, the greatest libraries also think of themselves as museums, with a conversation between Laurence Angel, president of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, and Carla Hayden, librarian of Congress, we are particularly lucky to be joined this evening by two exceptional women museum directors, Amélie Simier, director of the Rodin Museum in Paris, and Sacha Suda, director and CEO of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. They will engage in a dialogue moderated by Elizabeth Easton, director and co-founder of the Center for Curatorial Leadership, with whom we have had the great pleasure of co-organizing and co-curating this series. Before diving into tonight's conversation, I wanted to perhaps uh, take a minute and share with you another initiative Villa Albertine is about to launch, the Museum's Next Generation Program. While we wanted to listen throughout the year to the powerful voices of a new generation of museum leaders, uh, which is the goal of this museum series, we also wanted to contribute to the emergence of uh, the future generation of museum leaders, which is the ambition behind this new program, the Museum's Next Gen. We wanted in particular create new opportunities for the most promising young curators in France and the US to engage with the other side of the Atlantic through learning expeditions and develop a shared vision of the challenges that museum leaders will face in the years and decades ahead. Our ambition here is to empower a new generation of museum leaders in our countries and to promote collaboration between them. And with this ambition, um, the Museum's Next Generation program will welcome, in the next five years, 50 young museum professionals from France and the US, six to eight from France, and four Americans each year. The first French cohort was selected through a call for applications and is composed of eight brilliant young curators. And we made the bet among the team that most probably a future president of the Louvre is among them. So get ready to meet them when they are in New York. They will arrive in Los Angeles next Monday for a week of meetings, exchanges, and visits, notably at the Getty Museum, our main partner for this first edition, but also at the Huntington Library and Museum, the Broad, the Norton Simon Museum, the Hammer Museum, the LACMA, and, and others. The second part of their immersion will take place in New York in May, and we look forward to welcoming these French fellows in LA and New York for the first edition, but also to host um, other fellows in other cities and regions across the US in the upcoming years, as the program will travel across the country, much like Villa Albertine's resident. The American laureates for Museums Next Gen 2023 will be selected in the coming weeks and will be invited to travel to France this fall and attend an exceptional program there. Stay tuned for the call for applications to be launched very soon. This five-year initiative, creating opportunities for 50 incredibly promising American and French curators, is made possible with the transformative support of an individual donor to whom I wish to express our deepest gratitude. Before turning the floor over to Buffy, I would again like to thank her, as well as Sasha and Amélie, for being with us tonight. I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to the friends of Villa Albertine, in particular to Sana Sabag, Beatrice Stern, and Denise Littlefield Sobel, who made this project possible. And finally, I would like to thank Cartier for their support of the spring dialogues of this museum series. Our next dialogue will take place in about one month on April 20th. Buffy, merci beaucoup. The floor is yours. Merci. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gaëtan. It was astonishing to hear about your new curatorial program. It will change exchange and, and learning 
for generations to come. Really incredible. Congratulations. So it's my pleasure tonight to introduce Amélie Semier, who's the director of the Musée Rodin, a graduate of the École du Louvre and the Institut National du Patrimoine. She's a specialist in 19th century sculpture, a subject she taught at the École du Louvre for 15 years. She began her museum career as a curator of 19th and 20th century sculpture at the Petit Palais, the Museum of Fine Arts of the City of Paris, before directing two sculpture museums, the Musée Zadkine and the Musée Bordel in Paris. In 2021, she was appointed director of the Musée Rodin, which houses the world's largest collection of the artist's works, displayed both in the 18th century Hôtel de Biron in Paris and in Rodin's former home and studios in Meudon, west of Paris. Sasha Suda is the George D. Widener director and CEO of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. She was appointed in June 2022 and began her tenure just this last September. She brings a new generation of leadership to the PMA. Born in Toronto to Czech parents, she studied at Princeton University, where she rode crew on the Varsity Eight as stroke, uh, not usually in her bio, and um, then completed her master's degree in art history at Williams College and her PhD at NYU. Her professional career began at the Metropolitan Museum of Art across the street, where she worked in various roles in the medieval department between 2003 and 2011. She returned to her native Toronto to work at the Art Gallery of Ontario, first as assistant curator and eventually as curator of European art and the Elliott Chair of Prints and Drawings. From 2019 to 2022, she served as director and CEO of the National Gallery of Canada, we're so honored that both of these esteemed directors have agreed to speak to us this evening. So I would like to begin with a little focus on the fact that you were both scholars. And if you could talk about your journey to leadership. Amemi, would you like to go first? Oh, right. Um, I wasn't originally a scholar of sculpture, actually. I was a scholar of um, what, what, what was called at the time Ethnologie de la France, so that's um, French arts and craft, or French ethnology, or something. And then I became a scholar for sculpture, and that was absolutely delightful, because it is a small, fascinating, remarkable world where there's a number of research to be going on, as, as we all know. There's plenty to be doing still. It's, um, it's quite fascinating. And so I started at the Petit Palais, as you said, as a curator. and. Um, after 10 years, I took the direction of two wonderful artist studio museums. Um, it's, it is um, fascinating also to work on houses that were homes to the artists, studios to the artists. And there's a special feeling with working also with the whole large collection, which is what was left when the artist uh, died. Uh, that's part of the great pleasure of directing that kind of place where you know you're all focused on what the artist wanted, why they gave it to the nation or to the city of Paris or whatever. It's part of the challenge which is very rewarding and gives a sort of um, direct line to the whole team then. And to Sasha. Well, first of all, I feel my heart racing because we're in such a special place and Gaetan is such a rock star. That <laughs> announcement really blows <laughs> me away. Um, but also to be in your midst and um, to be here with Amelie. And really with colleagues from the Met, including, you know, I'm, I feel a bit of anxiety, I think, but because I'm sort of cleaved here between the IFA and the Met Museum, and there was a lot of anxiety walking across <laughs> that street. And mostly I try to avoid the IFA still, so. Um, and, and that's about me, not it. And I, I think, you know, my formative years were really spent between um, those two places, and in fact, I landed in the Met after graduating from undergraduate, my undergraduate degree at Princeton. And, you know, I worked there from the very beginning with uh, Dr. Barbara Baim, who's here tonight, and there really was no other way than to be a scholar and a curator uh, at a time when that's really how, you know, the Met defined itself, or at least self-proclaimed itself, uh, when you walked through that threshold. So it felt 
logical to me and when I didn't feel like finishing my PhD, um, Barbara said, it's your union card, so get it done. <laughs> and so I think those two things uh, have always gone together well for me and kind of keep your values straight in terms of what we're here to do and why we exist, even if it might not be obvious for everybody walking down the street. But my next question for you was you left the Met, which is a hard thing to do. And um, you took on greater leadership positions along the way. And for somebody, you know, there are some curators who stay scholars their whole life, and then there are others who feel the pull of more challenges. So both of you, that's clearly um, what happened. So a question, my first question would be, was it hard to leave the Met and um, was there some of that pull that you know you were going to be more challenged as you went on? Gosh, you know, I went where there was a full-time job. I mean, that's the reality <laughs> for, for most people. And to an institution that had an incredible collection, the Art Gallery of Ontario had just been given a gift from Ken Thompson of one of the great um, decorative arts collections, including amazing medieval works of art, ivory, and other things I didn't know nearly enough about, but I knew enough to know that that collection was a world of opportunity for the audience at that museum, but also for me as a curator. And um, what I learned quickly was would expand the horizons of the amazing curatorial network I had because there were objects, you know, the Met, for example, had lost at auction to that collector. And so the world is a sort of small place. So I was leaving this place, but going somewhere where I could sort of write a new story and that was, and take what I learned here to there. And that was really exciting. Um, and not hard at all in a way, knowing that somehow you could end up back where you started. Not maybe literally, but figuratively. So my next question is somewhat self-interested since I run a leadership program. The underpinning is the belief that curators can become directors and it's better that you have a curator become one than some kind of administrator person. And so I would like to ask you, is the fact that you were scholars important in your view to being a museum director? And how does that play out in your decision making? I mean, in my case, definitely being a curator and a curator of sculpture definitely made sort of the sort of way that I took um, to take care of artists' legacies, artists' bequests, artists' works, sculptors' work. You need to know, particularly for sculpture, I'd say, you need to know what you talk about, what you exhibit, what you show, what you want to share with people. So to me, the curatorial I'd say expertise is necessary, but then you need all the other skills, which are so enjoyable. So the manage management skill, the, the, so the taste. Well, it has its drawbacks, but it's, it's also good to, to, to have the team building thing too. That's super. And then, of course, the, 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 the love of sharing with the large audience, as large as we can, as, exclusive, as inclusive as we, as we can. And in the particular case of the Musée Rodin, also a taste for business, which is part of our job. Do, would you like to speak for just a minute about that? Because maybe you all aren't aware of this really modern, visionary decision on the part of Rodin to make the Musée Rodin a self-sustaining business model, well, which I think has a lot to do with that equity today, too. I think it's completely visionary. So do you want to the way about that? Yeah, I love the way you look at it. And it's true. It's, it's, we, we used to say in my team, we used to say we are the most American of French public museums. Um, this is a public museum. The Musée Rodin is indeed a public museum. Rodin bequested his works and his artistic rights to the French nation in exchange, to the Fr in exchange for the foundation of the Musée Rodin. And then he listed the ways the musée should be autonomous. And he did it as an, as an artist and an entrepreneur who really wanted his, his autonomy. So today, we are still totally self-sufficient. Totally. So Would you like to say how? 
<laughs> well, obviously, we've got the same recipes as you um, have, which is um, um, the entrance tickets, of course. The, um, well, actually, he sort of listed it all for us. So he listed the entrance tickets, the um, uh, editions, uh, reproductions. Um, um, the only thing he didn't think was, uh, was the rental spaces. So, so this is probably 20 or 30 years old. But our very specific uh, model is that he wanted his works to go on being dissemin disseminated in the whole world. And so he um, put his, he, he um, how would I say that? He, um, he put the, he, he, he gave his, uh, he had no heir, and so his heir is actually the Musée Rodin, and so we go on casting um, in Frondries from the original molds, from his original um, plaster casts, um, works that are today have been for more than a century in all the major collections, and then, as you know, you can find some the other side of, uh, of the street, um, given by the Cantos, for example. So it is a very important to us mission, which we treasure. Yeah, I just think today when equity and access is such an important idea on museums, Rodin had kind of envisioned it more than a century ago. It's quite remarkable. But just um, let's turn then to historical collections and how to make them come alive. Um, Sasha, I believe it was last week, or at least very recently, you announced a new African center at the PMA, the Bryn Center for African and African Diasporic Art. So you're branching out, you're filling holes in the collection. So what are you doing to make the PMA address the issues, the pressures, and the complexities on the nature of collections now and into the future? It's a lot of questions in there. Well, I'm and packing say, it in there. <laughs> I mean, you know, let's call it the notion of an encyclopedic museum is something that resonates probably with a lot of us in the room. Um, it's defined by what we experience often across the street. And it's, it's a myth, right? Because there are things missing. And what's missing is more glaring based on where you are. So coming to Philadelphia in 2023 and seeing that we have every continent in the world represented within the collection except for the continent of Africa is quite striking because 45% of Philadelphia's population identifies as black and that's just simple. Um, we've had a lot of pressure um, on the institution over the last several years. We were, you know, the site for protest uh, during the Black Lives Matters movement um, post the murder of George Floyd. And so these are pressing conversations that just seemed like incredible opportunities for the institution. So I sort of came to the PMA knowing that there was hope for change because there were opportunities to just step in and respond to needs of an audience that really loves this institution. Um, while I started on the first day of a wall-to-wall -wall strike, uh, those needs weren't expressed with <laughs> necessarily love or care, but at least there's that dynamism of them, you know, wanting you to be better and to meet new expectations. So, you know, I'd, I'd love to say that it's my brilliance that brought that to bear, but it's, you know, it's the really the commitment of audiences and the generosity of a single donor who said, I will step forward to do this on my fourth day, really. So just to say, you know, this is, this is there, it's in our DNA. And, you know, I don't really care what it looks like. You know, we can call it the Brin Center for African and African Diasporic Art, but it doesn't have to be a place. You know, of course I want things on view but I want it to be a place where knowledge is produced and shared and that's permeable and really kind of a modern way of thinking about museums, less about territory and more about, um, you know, sharing, uh, welcoming difference of opinion, bringing, you know, new perspectives. So, you know, and the thing that really was exciting to me was that he brings a collection, amazing collection of African art to the table but wanted to bring it to life by connecting it to, 
you know, pan-historical African diasporic stories. And, and that's very of the moment as well in terms of curatorial practice. So that's just, you know, fabulous that we can do that. I'd love to answer this question a year from now when we've hired a lead curator in that role and um, seen how that feels within the institution and how maybe that encourages everyone to work across boundaries because we know that increasingly, you know, the boundaries that we set up are historically are, are limiting from one territory to the next, which is mirrored often in our, in our galleries as well, but also so practical and makes it possible to budget for things and plan for things. So I think that it's all a work in progress. And I, I happen to think as a medievalist, tra trained as a medievalist, uh, of medieval manuscripts, so you know, we don't often get to see our things on view, at least for long periods of time. That the past is incredibly important to understanding the present, right? And and to try to think about a future without that the connection between those two things is sort of hopeless. And what I'd hope is that we can bring people in, and through those connections, create optimism for the future. Um, and push ourselves to think beyond what we already know. And, and that's why I think encyclopedic institutions, as you know, problematic as they may be, and as sites for protest and dialogue and discourse, that they are amongst the most exciting places on earth right now. And you know, I'm excited to jump into that with, with the team. Sounds like a dramatic first four days, a strike <laughs> and the offer of a, of a whole center being yeah. given to the museum. So Amélie, Rodin is a sculptor we all know. Um, how do you make Rodin come alive for now and into the future? Well, there's plenty of various methods, but I'd say once we were out of pandemics, and I took my job just after the pandemics, the, f the first thing we thought of was to, um, to open it wider to a larger family audience, particularly a larger family audience, meant that we immediately created an art lab, which, is, which was absolutely successful. In the, you remember the moment we all got back to museums. We could all again go into museums. We've got a large garden, as you can see on, on the photo, so that was also an attraction. And so we, with the art lab, which, was, which is a place where you can sort of drop in with the, with the kids, with the family, uh, play, um, um, model, um, draw, or whatever, then you can sort of reappropriate um, the works of Rodin and by um, looking at them differently, playing with them, and then go and visit the museum if you feel like, or go and see the, the, the Garden of Sculpture, which is also part of the visit. So that was one way, and we, I must say that our first year, we, we, we were... The, the numbers uh, went higher and... Uh, Tell everybody how many people visit the museum. I think uh, you might be surprised. Uh, we, we, we have um, a general basis. Well, we're on our, we're on our um, 2019 numbers, so we are um, 6,000 visitors per year, and I should add that... 600,000. 600,000 per year, sorry. And 70% um, <laughs> come from out of France, and in those 70%, we're quite proud, proud to say that in our hall um, visitors, it's 25% are come from the States. So it, we're, we love having people from the States. And, <laughs> and it's been, it's a long love story, I must say, from Rodin's time, as you know all, <laughs> to, to now. I was really stunned by that large number and impressed. Um, so now this is a series invented by Gaëtan for women leaders. Um, in the Center for Curatorial Leadership, we're very focused on women leaders as well. And um, it's an exception. I wonder if you'll be surprised to hear that Amélie is the fourth woman to run the Musée Rodin. And I asked her when we were upstairs, I said, I heard that you were part of a cohort of five women who were sculpture people and that you were legendary sculpture experts. And so, it's interesting, this history of directors of sculpture, the directors of the Musée Rondin, and this cohort of women. And you are the, at, are the third female director of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, something that is 
an incredibly important part of its legacy. So I just wanted to know if there was anything about that that, I mean, I will say, I went to visit a friend, a former fellow in CCL, in his office, his windowless office, and there was a photograph of Anne Dornancourt, whose, you know, legacy lives on. And I, so I was just um, wondering about the particular nature for both of you of inheriting the mantle um, of a female run institution. So do you want to talk about that for a minute? Sure. Uh, well, I can say that it was really important to me that there had been a long tenured woman who was successful in my role prior to my coming there. I think, you know, it's advice I got from many colleagues who are male directors is you want to go somewhere where people, you know, have accepted the notion of female leadership and that you know that you can have that kind of success. Because I had the sort of double whammy of being a woman and being younger. Um, and being seen as very old by our Gen Z colleagues. So, <laughs> you know, it's that, you know, I wanted to be able to succeed. I mean, it's a really, it's an interesting time to lead, right? So that was really important to me, not just at the PMA with Anne, but Jean Boggs, who had preceded me in Ottawa, you know, and so they brought her from Ottawa, and then she only stayed in Philly for three years, and then left, so they're kind of getting, you know, getting them back. Um, after I was in Ottawa for three years and coming here, and, and you know, we see a long tenure ahead. So that's important, but Philadelphia similarly has many, many strong female leaders um, who, had, who have had a lot of luck fundraising and doing major and ambitious projects. And so it's something I think about, absolutely, and Anne's absence is something, you know, I feel every day. Right. And, and I think she made such a huge impact and she was lost so suddenly and unexpectedly uh, that people still talk to me about Anne as if she had been there the week before. And it's something that, you know, I pay a lot of attention to. I, Anne has been a guiding light on a number of things. Coming back from the strike, I heard from everybody that, you know, there used to be this table and Anne would sit and have lunch with people. And if, you know, it's not like that anymore, we don't have the table. so. Uh, I started doing coffee and donuts every week, and it's it's like brought back this great feeling for people uh, about Anne, even those who weren't there with her, but who's who's who've internalized that that story, that mythology about a collegial kind of really soft institution. So, uh, you know, I I live with it, and I live try to live up to those expectations, and. I also am the same height as her, and I, you know, some people mistake me for her. It's like they've seen a ghost. So there's, you know, that's it's complex, but it's it's a, it's an, a true honor. It's a very unique kind of situation. It is. Well, I mean, she was, and I think it distinguished the Philadelphia Museum as well. It's a very special place. Um, so I'm in you and your in your sculpture cohort, and um, and the fact that so many women have led the museum is sculpture a particularly female draw? S strangely enough, and I don't know if it's the same here, but strangely enough, it is, yes. Strangely enough, sc uh, sculpture attracts uh, women, or maybe women are attracted to sculpture, or maybe they're attracted into the sorority of sculpture somehow. Because as, as, um, as you go into a studio, I mean, you have to be a group of you to be able to work on a, on a sculpture. And if you want to um, carry a sculpture, well, it's better if you're uh, qu quite a number of them and, and so on and so forth. So that's my bet that sculpture is more collective somehow and that we are very good at being collective too. On the, on, on, and I've, I feel that all our um, sculptors' museums in France are mostly Male sculptors' museums, but right. it's it's mostly women who take care of them, as um, it was when during their lifetime when there were wonderful women around them who were not always visible, but who were the strengthful powers that helped them somehow. So yes, there's been directors, female directors, since the the 1950s in the Musée Rodin, strengthful figures, all of them, very much so. 
um, one of my one of our collectors who's um, now um, in his 80s, says, um, came, came to me two weeks after my arrival. He wanted to buy um, a new edition of a wonderful work we, we, we are um, uh, newly editing. And so he said, you know, you're my fifth director. <laughs> I've known them all. And then he just sort of uh, pinta pointed out the story with them all. But he started with a woman director, a female director. And so he said, she was harsh. She was stuck with me. I had to visit her four years. And then the fifth years, she, ag she agreed to sell me something. Wow. And he's got a major collection, visible in public in Switzerland <laughs> now. Wow, that's interesting. Leonard, yeah, you're right. Um, so let's switch for a moment to talk about, I think both of you and things I've read about you speak about um, prioritizing equity in your agendas for your museums. And so I'd like you to, I mean, certainly museums across the country, um, everything we do has equity um, at its core, but how does it manifest itself in the Musée Rodin? Well, part of the equity is the reaching out of a large audience, so it can be, inside the museum, so we try and attract and have programs outreaching, um, but we've been doing that, I mean, for years now, for, for 20 or 30 years, I guess, outreaching um, people who usually do not come to the museums, so we go to them, we go to hospitals, we go to prisons, uh, we take them if we can home. We've got a major gallery in the midst of the Hotel Biron. There's a gallery devoted to the programs we, we're doing with them. We're also um, um, going, part of the, I guess part of the model that Rodin um, uh, left us is also to reach out um, people all over the world so that his work could be disseminated all over the place. So that's also part of, mi of our mission is to be sure that there are Rodin works um, in all countries uh, seen by many and I guess it's uh, also um, one of the, I'd say, one of the uh, obvious um, visible results is that, for example, major works that, like The Thinker or The Kiss are so well known all over the planet. And Sasha? Well, I think, you know, all of us are thinking about this sort of collectively right now, and what I think COVID gave us the privilege of doing was really sitting still and thinking about how does it manifest here at this museum in this place with this community that we serve. And so in Philadelphia, we're really thinking about representation within the collection, yes, and staffing, of course. But then the other big ones, you know, as an institution that just left a big building project just in its rear view mirror, but contracting, um, contracting diverse contractors and building companies, how we spend our money, right, a lot of our money comes from public sources and we live in a particular place in a particular city, uh, but also community engagement, of course, and, and not necessarily reinventing the wheel, but going to community, meeting community where they are and asking, what do you need? You know, who's serving you well? How do we work with them, amplify that work, invest in what you need and not in what we think you need? And so, you know, I have the benefit of this conversation having already started and people having the will and the goodwill to make this work happen. So it feels like we're, we're moving in that place and you really can't be in Philadelphia and not be having this conversation right now, which um, also feels like a lucky place to be. So um, here's a question for you. Are there things that you would like to do that for whatever reason you cannot do? Question, Buffy. I know. My son, Let me th my son who's in the audience, <laughs> helped me devise that question. Let me think. <laughs> Say that again. Uh, qu uh, something okay. Is there something that you would like to do that for some reason you can't do, and what would that be? Ha. Huh. I'd say, I'd say the future is wide open. I'm not sure there's something really? immediately. Yeah, that's what I feel. I'm not sure there's something I would wish to do, I couldn't do, because we do find the means, uh, um, and we do find also the people to help us to do, the so. That's France for you. <laughs> That's why you have this series, because people will leave saying, in France, everything is possible. <laughs> there are no barriers. 
<laughs> well, I certainly do. And I mean, you got, can you lead without believing that also? You, you, don't, you don't need to. I mean, it's also part of the attraction of, of uh, if you want to, to lead a whole team, you also have to be able to have their eye twinkle with yours. Yes. So, no, I can't. I'll try and think, and maybe I'll find the answer <laughs> later on. But immediately, it's just that sometimes I feel the Hotel Biron is a bit small. So, for example, one of the, the, the big plans I had when I arrived and I took the job was um, I, I felt so frustrated not to have an, uh, um, an art club annually, nonstop, as a place where to, you know, to, to experiment with culture, with modelage and all that. And so we are all... We're all totally 18th century protected, so it's difficult to build anything in the garden. That's, that is frustrating. But we are currently working on a way of, um, well, uh, to find a way to avoid those um, um, historical monuments classification and find a way of hosting a new place where we can do that. So I'm sure we'll find the way. And you? I mean, I still also feel like I'm in, a bit in the honeymoon period, so... There's nothing I hit a brick wall with yet, but I will say there were times during COVID where I read all the same articles everyone here read about how, you know, museums really need to learn to leave the blockbuster exhibition behind, dive into the collection, and, you know, reinvent the business model. And, you know, I wish we really could do that right now. I, I think we're gonna have great programs, but we really can't think about our program without thinking about how to drive attendance. And I wonder, you know, how we'll get there. And I wish I knew the answer to that. And I wish we were still in that conversation, but we're all busy sort of just kind of rebuilding ourselves. And so it's sort of going back to that, that moment of optimism and curiosity, which was possible when we couldn't do anything else. And how do we get there? Okay, so this is going to be my last question before we open it up to your questions. Um, what keeps you up at night? <laughs> I'm, okay, you go first. <laughs> Thanks, Sasha. Uh, there's a lot of things. Um, <laughs> I would say most of all uh, in Philadelphia, for me, boring answer is just how the complexity of the campus. We have this beautiful new $300 million Frank Gehry um, renovation in part of the building, but you know the other part is still very much um, in its original state. We have two historic homes. We have two offsite storage places. We have uh, Pearlman, which is uh, our mostly admin building not to mention the Rodin Museum. And so it's just kind of wrapping my head around how much I need to learn to have peace of mind, you know? And of course, all our teams were depleted during COVID, so uh, knowing that we have the support we need for those very physical challenges and anxieties so that nobody else has to worry about it. And um, I'd say what keeps us me, me at, up at night is, um, um, making Rodin always relevant into his into the second century of his museum. That's a real challenge. I mean, uh, our museums are challenges. What extraordinary thing to think that you can keep works and museums going on and forever. That's fascinating. Well, thank you very much. And do uh, does anybody in the audience have any questions for this illustrious pair? We have one in the front row. Hi, my name is Karen. I work at Art News. Okay, wait just one sec for uh, the mic. Hi, my name is Karen. Uh, I work for Art News and I'm also from Toronto. Uh, my question is in regards to, um, to Sasha, what was the biggest thing that you learned um, as a curator at the Art Gallery of Ontario with a similarly diverse city basis and audience that that you was you would always think if i ever became a director i would apply to leadership um, of a museum in a similarly diverse city sure that's a great question and i think it applies to the work i did here as a you know medievalist coming to toronto i went from this amazing womb-like department of 
fellow medievalists and the kind of cold reality of being the only historic curator uh, for a period of time in Toronto, surrounded by contemporary thinkers and curators and an audience that really, um, you know, didn't know much about for sure the medieval and certainly um, European decorative arts because it was a totally new collection to the AGO. And I would often think back to here knowing that, you know, we're not entitled to any audience. You know, you have to work to build that audience and you have to tell great stories to build that audience. And I think that that's not very profound at all, but moving into a directorship, it's all about telling stories. You know, it's about encouraging curators to tell great stories, but also turning their stories into one fantastic story that you can tell to raise money, to make the institution hum, um, to tell a story about the institution that can resonate with all of these different communities that you serve. And, you know, in Toronto, we really had to work hard at that because as the text told me at the beginning, we used to have just art, meaning two dimensional things. And now we have all this stuff. <laughs> and so the socialization started there, you know, what's the story about this, this stuff and how does it become art for them? Thanks. Any other questions? I'm sure there must be one other, oh, a few. Hi, I just wanted to say that the collab with the Whitney of the Jasper Johns, I know that probably wasn't during your time, but that was phenomenal. And I love seeing that collaboration because I always have museums in their own silos. And it was just beautiful to see that type of collaboration. It was very enriching to experience both. And I'm wondering if there are plans to further that <laughs> style of exhibition. Well, we were, we were drumming up some ideas upstairs and absolutely, so that's nice to hear. I was not there, sadly. There was Good evening, uh, um, it's a pleasure to be here. I have a question, just regarding uh, the future of museums and museum professionals. When you are um, mentoring uh, young people coming into the field, what skills, competencies, or experiences do you really encourage them to lean into? Um, that you believe will really help them be successful as they navigate their career? I can answer you for French uh, professionals, but definitely, obviously, the um, 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 historian, history of art, uh, curatorial skills are one thing, but if we want to lead them somewhere, the soft skills are so important too. I'd insist on that with, my, with the trainees or uh, I would have around me. So, and also the um, sensitivity to um, the, the group of people they're meeting, the groups of people they're meeting, both professionally and also the visitors. Um, we, we all know curators who are less interested in two visitors, and as we all know, uh, they make, well, yes, don't we, Buffy? And as we all know, they uh, really are the salt of, of our, our mission and of the earth. I would concur with all of that and say the soft side of things, being able to work with people, being able to value the work of all the people that make everything happen from you know the guys in the crating room to um, all of the people that install, but also marketing, which can be hard sometimes, for example, for curators. And, you know, the kind of how to influence people. It's not really new. There's a book from the 80s, right? How to make friends and influence people. I think it's more <laughs> important than ever uh, because there's can be s these misalignments within institutions. And I think with that is just curiosity and optimism. And obviously, um, a certain expertise matters, but, you know, more and more, you're going to have to take on a world beyond that. So a willingness to learn from other people. And I mean, for me, the most important thing is for them to be able to say, I don't know. You know, that's the marker of the most uh, dependable person too, and bringing in people to, to help them along, so. Uh, hello, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. 
Um, I would say that's a question for Sasha, just because I don't think Rodin went through the accessioning, but because Sasha worked in Canada and the United States, my question is, is this uh, process different conceptually, or it's the same, uh, the accession, how is it different in Canada and in the United States? Yeah, I can tell you in Toronto, there was quite an active deaccessioning program there, um, always to support future works, uh, purchases of works of art. And I worked for a curator there who I thought did an incredible job, sort of creating a rigorous process and also, you know, being quite confident and open to a, a discussion about it and, and, and criticism around it. So created a sense of transparency that allowed the program to, to continue. And as a result, it allowed the collection to grow in a place where acquisition funds were hard to come by. When I had come to Ottawa, they had famously had a really um, public case of deaccessioning uh, be retracted because of the negative public opinion around the attempted sale of a Chagall. So there was was lot less, uh, people were much more timid for obvious reasons. So each institution has its own story and the PMA has also historically uh, deaccessioned works to buy or upgrade works. And I think every institution is entering that conversation based on their own you know, their own situation, which is, it's never an easy discussion. And, you know, when you have, for example, like in Philadelphia, a board of 65 board members, there's a, such a huge variety of opinions as well. So in the case of deaccession, I think it creates a very robust conversation that can also slow down a conversation in a way that's healthy. So I, I think it really depends each institution, its governance structure, and you know, it's financial situation um, with in regard to acquisitions, but now, of course, that conversation is bigger, and I don't have experience with that conversation so far. And as you know, um, French public museums are not deaccessioning. It doesn't exist yet. <laughs> Anyone else? I'm the, I'm the editor of Art News, so we're just going to barrage you with questions. Um, I, I was wondering if we can just return to the idea of the encyclopedic museum for a second. And I mean, I guess, Sasha, you'd be the natural person to answer this, but I would love if anyone on the panel would, would address it. I think that we're seeing more recently sort of different approaches to that. Like what Michael Govan is doing at LACMA is maybe an extreme example. I think what you know, the, the Louvre in Abu Dhabi is similarly maybe an extreme example of a, of a so-called universal museum. But I think there's generally talk about how the traditional categories or historical categories are no longer sufficient or desirable. Um, can you foresee a time when sort of encyclopedic museums really sort of throw out the rule book on that? You know, I've done a lot of thinking about how one can structure curatorial departments to better address the sort of porous and expanding nature of what the world is. And, um, you know, with the chief curator and deputy director at the PMA, Carlos Basualdo, we've really been thinking about kind of how to broaden the conversation around modern art to be more global as well. And naturally, we start with the structure and go, okay, like what's missing in the structure, but the structure is always so limiting. And so, uh, you know, I... Well, that's kind of what I mean. Yeah. So structure. But I'm not, you know, yes and no. I, I'm not convinced that you can create a new structure without the right people and have it work either. So I think, you know, we're, pushing this a little bit with the Center for African and African Diasporic Art because, of course, people in the contemporary department, photography department, are and want to and should be collecting African-American art, for example. 
but how they interface with that collection, how the custodial responsibilities relate to programming responsibilities, those are all things that we're going to figure out as we go along. And there are other museum directors who have thought more about this and um, executed more elegantly or at all on it so far than I have, that's for sure. But at the end of the day, I think it really matters that you have people within the organization who want to push whatever the existing structure is beyond where it is, who aren't satisfied with, okay, well, we've crossed the threshold into your galleries, I'm not touching that, but who are incentivized but also self-motivated to push those conversations a bit further. And, you know, we know there are curators who do that and curators who don't. We know there are directors who encourage that and directors who don't. Um, board members who want to see that happen and board members who don't. I don't think that's going to change, even as the world changes. So it's, you know, staying accountable to it somehow is important. I think that's, you know, the positive side of protest and discourse and everything that's happening outside of the institution. Because I think where we run into trouble is when people can see we're not even trying. And so it's that, you know, is it encyclopedic or are we trying to be more than what we are today. And I think there's a lot of goodwill when you can be seen inviting people in or doing more than just the, the basics of what you have to be doing based on your map. I'd like to say something that touches on your visionary program for young curators and really having an exchange because the, at the CCL we have a program for PhD students. And what we find is there's a huge demand for it. And nobody works on a topic that conforms to a museum department. Now, people study borders, they study identity. I worked, I did my PhD on an artist. Nobody works on an artist. It, it's like, that doesn't happen anymore. And I think the more people are feeding the field, and I think there is this moment post-COVID of people coming into their jobs. There are opportunities that the more people who don't fit the traditional boundaries of the encyclopedic museum or museums as we've thought of them, the more that those boundaries will be broken. I mean, I always talk about the person in our PhD program who studied Greek pots and performance. Well, where does she, what department does she work in? And I think, um, the issues, uh, I mean, I see Jay Levinson is here from MoMA with whom we do a global program for curators in modern and contemporary from around the world. Well, they don't work in buildings with bricks and mortar and edifices, those curators, and on very little money, they do miraculous collaborations all over the world, often skipping New York and America. And um, I think those are the lessons that are beginning to emerge that will eventually really inform um, museums because those are the next generation of people who will, who will work in them. So I think there's hope for a broad perspective coming down the pike. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you very much for this very inspiring discussion. I think your institutions are very lucky to have you. And so were we tonight to, to listen to the two of you. Uh, perhaps since Amelie um, defined the Rodin Museum as an American museum, now I'm happy to say that uh, here comes the real French part of this evening with champagne and chouquette in the marble room. Merci beaucoup. Thank you.